Isaiah 45. <clears throat> it's interesting that, uh, you know, the world, with their music, the emphasis is on the beat. With us, the emphasis are on the words. The words are supposed to have a pack a punch. Uh, ruler and overruler is the title of this evening's consideration. When Isaiah wrote these words, Assyria, still the superpower in that region of the world, Persia, uh, which the Medes and the Persians would overthrow the Babylonians, the Babylonians would overthrow the, the Assyrians and then the Medo-Persians. Uh, but at this time in history, Persia was just really nothing, uh, not compared to, to Assyria. Jerusalem, life was just thriving there. The things were flourishing for them. There was no evidence to the naked eye that destruction and deportation awaited Judah at the hands of the Babylonians, who also were not a big power at this time. And yet the prophet was able to lay it all out long before the events took place, and that generation of Jews that lived to read Isaiah's prophecy in his day, either trusted the word of God from the prophet or did not. And that generation that then saw those prophecies fulfilled, same thing, because many of them remained uh, just uh, uh, not receptive and idolatrous and difficult. But then, of course, many others responded. Nothing's changed in all those times. Two thieves on the cross, two outlaws on the cross. One hears the message and receives Christ, the other rejects him. So looking at verse 1, thus says Yahweh to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Now Cyrus is the only pagan ruler uh, to be honored with such a title uh, from God through his prophets. And he is selected for a purpose, and that purpose will be to restore the Jewish people to the, to the promised land from Babylon. Uh, again, these events are 150 years away. Cyrus won't be born for another 100 years. We've talked about him already. But he is a vessel of God. He will be when he's comes to the throne. He's first introduced to us in chapter 41 in, the, in verses two, and 2 through 4. But that term, anointed, that is used here is the basis for our word Messiah, although he is not the Messiah. It is used in the Old Testament in a, in a general way, mainly when a, a, a king was selected or the sons of Aaron. They were anointed uh, they were chosen for service, and that word Mashiach was used uh, for them also. And, uh, of course, by the time we come to the New Testament, it is reserved for Jesus Christ. And the woman at the well, she said, I know when Messiah comes, and Jesus said, well, the one you're talking to you is the one, is the Messiah. And so that title... Uh, loan to Cyrus as one that God has pinpointed for a particular work. And God is sovereign, even over the unbelievers, even over the unbelieving kings, the pagan kings. Daniel, uh, he, in, in his fourth chapter, addressing Nebuchadnezzar, who was not on the scene yet, not even born yet, he'll come later, in history, but at that time, Daniel writes this when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was uh, went crazy because of pride. He lost his mind, went insane. And uh, the words to him was, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Now, this can cause a lot of problems for us because the questions abound. We're going to come to God. Uh, does he create calamity? Where does it come from? What's going on with that? Well, Isaiah is going to talk about it, but right now he continues here in verse 1, whose right hand I have held, uh, though not a worshiper of Yahweh, uh, for the believer when God 
holds our hand. It indicates his presence and his compassion and his call for bravery on our part because of our faith that he is with us. But for the unbelieving instrument of God, it indicates the sovereign control and presence, uh, even with such a one as Cyrus. And the affairs of men are, are never out of God's control, which brings us to free will. Free will is similar. Uh, you, we, we are free to make choices. We are created in the image of God in spite of the fall. And one of those things is we can make moral decisions. We can decide what is right and what is wrong. Uh, we are free to elect or we are free to reject. However, we are not free to choose the consequences of those choices. And this is Im Im important in life uh, to, to learn that the consequences belong to the sovereignty of God. There can, there can be good, a good outcome or it can be um, not so good. And that's why we become students of the word, to find out how to make right choices in Christ. But since God called this a hundred years before his birth, he retains the rights of foretelling, prophecy, with purpose, divine prophecy. And when Cyrus conquered in that ancient world, he was told that it was the God of the Jews who had long ago had this written down. Remember, the Jews, they were in many high places in the Babylonian court, the Medo-Persian court. Uh, they held high positions, and they had a lot of influence. And they most certainly uh, would tell the rulers what was in the scriptures if it pertained to them. And this is, remember, Ezra, the book of Ezra, that... It, documents the return of the Jewish people from the Babylon, Babylonian captivity when Cyrus will give the order. Uh, the Jews wrote that book, and it was the Jews in the court that laid out, hey, Cyrus is making this edict. We'll get to some of those quotes in a little bit. But God is in control of it all. Uh, bookmark in your head, that, that causes problems, uh, uh, perplexities that we should talk about in a little bit. And so... Um, there would be no question that Cyrus would hear about these prophecies and uh, what is he going to do with them? Look, just because you see something miraculous or, or phenomenal, again, means still you've got to make that free will thing, that choice. Judas made his choice and went to his own place. The others, uh, they uh, acted on the miracles. So just because Cyrus sees his name in the ancient writings doesn't mean he's going to say, oh, Yahweh is God, there is no other. He's more than likely going to say, Yahweh is a God, and I've got mine. And they're gods too. That's how it's going to come out, more than likely. To subdue nations before him and loose the armor now uh, of kings. That word armor is actually... A poor rendering in the New King James Version. Uh, the translators likely attached the event to Isaiah 5, 27, and, give, and they gave us an interpretive rendering. Really, the word is loyan. So the fear is going to take hold of anybody who stands in the way of Cyrus, uh, and he's going to conquer them. And that's what, what Isaiah is going with all of this. So when you read these things, you say, what am I reading? Well, I'm telling you what you're reading, if, you, if you're still uh, not sure. To open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Now, this is a detailed prophecy, a little, just a detail about Babylon's fall. Those, the, Babylon had these double doors that faced this uh, defensive moat that was around the city. Well, when the Medes, Medes and Persians conquered the city, those doors were, were open. They weren't locked. And they came in. And they conquered the city with, uh, pretty much peacefully. In fact, the city was so big, it took three days before some people in the city found out that there was a regime change. And so uh, an interesting little detail there that the Jews would have picked up. But whether anybody would have believed them is another story. In verse 2, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. 
And so God will clear the way, and in 539 years thereabout before the coming of Christ, Cyrus, he is um, going to conquer the Babylonians, and then he is going to release the Jews to their promised land. And he's going to do that to other people too. That's important that we don't think, oh, just the Jews received this blessing or, or this treatment. Uh, he did it to many peoples. It was his uh, uh, radical policy. And we've, we've talked about this in other sections uh, concerning, probably in, the, in Nehemiah and, and Ezra. Anyway, verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness, the hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, Yahweh, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. So God is serving him notice. He's saying, I'm going to do these things ahead of time that you will understand that the God of the Jews is the only God, which is a big, was a big issue. Now, these unseen riches, the treasures of darkness, it's not, it's actual literal, uh, not po this poetic language. There's other places in the scripture where it is, but here, the treasuries of those days were built without windows for obvious reasons, I, I would think. There's... You know, you don't want bad guys to just find a portal. And so this is likely an allusion to the wealth of Sardis, uh, which Cyrus is going to capture the city of Sardis. And Croesus the king was, you know, the Midas touch. You know, he was this incredible amount of wealth he possessed. Well, it's all going to go to Cyrus. Cyrus enriched himself with incalculable amounts of wealth from uh, Croesus there in Sardis and from the Babylonians. And God had, again, prophesied these things. I think when he heard these things, he was very impressed. But that's not good enough. Not good enough to be impressed by the gospel story. Not good enough to be impressed by a predictive prophecy. You have to act on it. Something's got to change. Um, it begins with repentance, the first step. And that means change, change directions. You now side with God. You're going the other way, not your own way. Uh, even if it is a struggle, God will receive that. He continues here in verse 3 at the bottom, that you may know that I am Yahweh, who call you by your name, am God of Israel. Now, this chapter, all of Isaiah is just, you know, there are these pockets of Isaiah that reaches out to the Gentiles. This is one of the chapters that does it a lot. And here he is reaching out to the Gentile king, which means he's reaching out to Gentiles. Because if Cyrus is given the opportunity to come to Yahweh, then everybody uh, should have that opportunity. Of course, is, that simplifies it. Uh, just saying it that way, but in reality, that there's so much clutter in the way to get people to leave uh, the false gods of, of their life. But evidently, uh, Cyrus acknowledged Yahweh as God of Israel, but went no further. Verse four: For Jacob is my servant; uh, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. Interesting, in the New Testament, when we get to the elect, it's by context we understand if he's talking about the church or the Jews. Matthew 24, he's talking about Israel, but in John's uh, second or third letter he, to the elect lady, he's talking about the church. So you have to follow the context, and, and for good reasons John would use that, because they embraced the, the Old Testament, as we should also, and the language of the Old Testament. Uh, the proof that we do is we, we name out many of our children or have, you know, Old Testament names like David and uh, no, not Goliath, though. He doesn't he doesn't get in. Uh, anyway, the identity of the Jews is called out. Jacob, my servant, uh, uh, the Jews, uh, God is participating with them still. I have named you. Now he's talking about Cyrus and his successes are not random. That's the that's a big part of his life and all life. They were arranged, his successes, and they were announced by Yahweh over a century beforehand. There is no random or whimsical selections with God. There are no random or whimsical selections with God. 
He elected the Jewish people because of Abraham's faithfulness. At a time where God couldn't find faithfulness, he found what he was looking for in Abraham. He made out of the right stuff. But it wasn't because of Abraham's work, his deeds. Like, boy, he's a good boy. It was because of his faith. John chapter 8, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Well, that ruffled a lot of feathers because he was telling them that he was self-existent, that he's always been. And he's speaking about what we know to be a Christophany, an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament as a full-grown man before the, the virgin birth. And there are several of, of those events in the Old Testament. Jesus is referring to this one. You know, when he went to tell Abraham, uh, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And there was Abraham interceding on behalf of those people. <laughs> you know, the flesh would say, yes, Lord, can I watch? But Abraham was praying, Lord, you sure about this? It's a, a remarkable passage of Scripture put this way, not to show that God needed some help with Abraham, but to, to just bring out these attributes of a righteous man in the presence of a holy God. Well, also in John, John 6, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. There are those that say, well, you know, faith is, you know, we, we're saved by grace. We are. But through faith, without that faith, you're not going to get that grace. And it is a work of faith, not of flesh. And that distinction should be made. Some doctrines get all twisted uh, to me or upside down because they say, well, faith is a work, so God has to save you. You can't come to him. And like, oh, you, that's, that's not even in the Bible. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, anyway, God made his choice of Abraham. Then he refined his choice. He began to narrow it down. And to do this, he chose Jacob, who became Israel, but he filtered out Ishmael and Esau, Abraham's son, his other son, and he had others with Keturah, uh, and his grandson, Esau. Why didn't they get chosen? What, what got Jacob chosen? Isaac and Jacob, that's the line of the Jewish people. Uh, well, we, we know, of course, because we don't read of the, the God of Ishmael, the God of, I, uh, of, of Esau. We do read of the God of Isaac and Jacob because those other two men were just not the right stuff that God was looking for. I'm not saying they're doomed and going to hell. I am saying that they lacked what God wanted, and he found it in enough of it in Isaac and Jacob. And thank God they weren't perfect men because then that would overshadow you know, us. Like, man, I, I, you know, I can't be that good. Well, it's not our goodness that gets us saved. It's faith. It's trusting God's goodness. Well, uh, he further refined after choosing uh, to identify with the descendants of Jacob, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another filter was put in place to eliminate all who refused the lordship of another son, uh, the son of Abraham according to the flesh. But the spirit, this is the son of God. This time it's not Abraham's son Isaac, but God's son. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And when we say gave, he means from the manger to the cross, to the empty tomb, to the return. Luke chapter 2. This is, you know, I, I love, you know, it's in my devotions. I'm in Luke also. Um, I read the whole Bible every day. <laughs> What would you do if you could do that? You'd be so, I mean, what? You could, it's not even practical. Anyway, uh, Luke chapter 2. Then the angel said to them, this, these are the shepherds out in the field. And shepherds were tough guys, not only because they had to deal with the sheep and all that's out there, but they had to deal with, you know, sheep robbers and robbers, period. So they usually carried, you know, they were armed with little daggers and such. But anyway, uh, these are the guys 
that uh, the angels go to. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. I bring you the gospel, which will be to all people. This is at the birth of Christ. There he is in the manger in Bethlehem. And he, the angel is saying, the gospel is for everyone. He didn't say, I'm bringing this to the Jewish people. Well, they're included. Genesis 12 goes way, it goes way back to Adam and Eve. But in Genesis 12, God said to Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And the Jews missed this. Isaiah does not miss it. But the Jews as a people, they're still missing it. They still look down on Gentiles. And this is the, rabab, the rabbis uh, pushing this forward over the centuries. Anyway, John 10, 16. Jesus said, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Well, pause there. We say, well, I, I don't believe in the New Testament. Well, I can give you Old Testament verses. Jesus is just pointing to the, to the New Testament, uh, you know, pointing to the Old Testament verses in the New Testament. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. That means non-Jews. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, when the people heard that, they weren't thinking Gentiles. They were thinking people up in Galilee or somewhere or somewhere else. Just, but, but then when Paul and Stephen and the rest come along, they figured it out, and uh, they had a hard road. Anyway, he says here in verse 4, though you have not known me. Now, his acknowledgment of Yahweh when he does acknowledge Yahweh in Ezra chapter 1, but it's superficial. It's politics. And he, because, again, he acknowledged other deities and other people's gods also. A blend of ecumenicism and universalism. You know, God's everywhere. You know, you know, all religions work. And what happens when those two religions disagree with each other? How do you reconcile that? Well, with Christianity, what happens when two denominations don't agree? Well, we always agree on the essentials of our faith. Where we start getting into fistfights, verbal fistfights, is, is on the little stuff. You know, how does God save a person? Well, the Calvinists have their wrong views about that. And then, you, so little things like that, that, that's not a critical doctrine. You can make it one by causing trouble, but uh, it is not a critical, crit there are other ones. There are Christians that don't believe in the rapture. That will not keep them out of heaven. They just get there slower. <laughs> so, people that don't believe in the rapture, you'll know when the rapture comes, they'll be the ones with the surprise look on their face and upside down. Well, anyway, uh, this, uh, again, so his, uh, Isaiah's, prophecy, Isaiah's prophecies do not require that Cyrus renounce his false gods. The spotlight is on God, calling it before it happens. It's really not on Cyrus. He's just the instrument. And God's vessels, here's the thing about God's vessels. They have a spigot. They're not just, you know, they, don't, they do not just keep everything, contain everything, a, a jar with a lid, like the Dead Sea. When God pours into his vessels, it is with the intention of working through that vessel, flowing and there must be an outflow. That is effective Christianity. And you really can't do that sitting home in your living room all day and not rubbing elbows with people who annoy you. And, and, and other people are always a problem. Um, it's always somebody else's kid. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you've got to learn how to deal with that. Fact, he, the, there's, a, there's a cylinder, the, the Cyrus cylinder. It's not very big. It's made of clay. And it is, uh, his scribes wrote down things about Cyrus uh, that attributed, uh, that he attributed his successes to Marduk and Nebo, his, his gods. So there's the proof. Is there an outside chance that's along the line he converted? A, yeah, of course, but you can't, you can't live that way. You, 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 you can't. You have to deal with what's in front of you, the facts that you have. And the fact is, he's not converted. And that's going to come up. I'm saying this because we're coming to things that will make us have to reconcile these words. Verse 5. Continuing, Isaiah speaks, God speaking through him. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. 
And that leaves room for, well, there you go. He doesn't know him. But anyway, this is the first of seven. There are no other gods just in this chapter. And Isaiah hits it many times. And in, 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 as I mentioned, this chapter, in chapter 43, chapter 44, and chapter 46. Because the, the Jewish people in Jerusalem going to the temple, but also had their little shrines at home. Uh, I guess today we'd say they'd have their little statue on the dashboard still. Um, anyway, uh, the king of Assyria, he was held accountable because he was so arrogant. Of course, he, would, he refused to acknowledge the Jewish God. And in chapter 10, we read about that, and God dealt with him for that. Cyrus is going to acknowledge the Jewish God as the God of the Jews. We remember the ancients had believed in the local gods. Uh, but... Uh, unlike the Assyrians, Cyrus helped the Jewish people uh, reestablish their, their, their nation and their temple. And uh, Syria, of course, took the Jews out of their land, and they did it in a very vicious way. Um, I don't know. You can go on and on and on about this, but we've got more stuff to cover. Verse 6 that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am Yahweh. There is no other. Now, of course, Isaiah loves this. And uh, all the righteous love this. One of the things we like so much about the prophecies of Isaiah are these kind of statements coming from God to, to us. Now, Cyrus means, incidentally, the name means the sun. And here it says that you may know from the rising of the sun. So, of course, there's, there's some metaphor and poetic language there and veiled, you know, this, it's pretty, pretty slick of Isaiah. He's a smart guy. Anyway, uh, by hearing what great things Yahweh did by Cyrus for God's people from east to west, this would create belief in, in some people. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that Daniel influenced Cyrus using the pro these prophecies in Isaiah. I don't doubt that. Daniel was around to the end. I mean, he, 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 was, he was in his 90s or, or maybe 100 or so before he finally left this world. And he was a remarkable figure. You know, one of the best scenes is when they want to decorate him with, oh, here's beads and necklaces for you telling us what the handwriting on the wall is. And he said, keep your junk. I don't know. Wampum is what that was. He didn't want it. So anyway, no other God but the God of the Jews, which is now the, so he moves Christ as Messiah unto Christ, the, the Gentile anointed one also Ephesians 4 one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all so with the Trinity they had to guard against you know polytheism that the, the Trinity is not three different gods it is one God and three personalities within him on for our sake the Spirit of God for the Holy Spirit coming from God and made available to us, and is every bit uh, uh, has a personality, and uh, he teaches, and he is, um, of course, a member of the Godhead. Verse: We can only understand the Trinity, but so far, but we get enough of it to know that it ain't, it ain't going away, unless you use a black uh, uh, marker in your Bible to edit those words out. Verse seven. I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, or I, Yahweh, do these things. Well, you love it. God steps forward and says, okay, let's get this out on the table. Where's all this mess coming from? Who's doing it? Whose fault is it? Who's in control? It's a typical Hebraic expression to use pairs of opposites, light and dark, peace and calamity. That's their style, and it's effective. But darkness is created. Uh, darkness was not just there waiting for light, somebody to turn the light switch on. Darkness as we know it is a created thing. Psalm, and I'll get to that in a couple of ways. Beginning with Psalm 104, the psalmist says to God, you make darkness and it is night 
in which all the beasts of the forest creep about, and they do. Look, I stand in my woods at night, I turn the light on, and I see all these little green things. They look like ruby, they're red and they're green, they look like little rubies. They have spider eyes. You walk up to them, it's like, that's a spider. Yeesh, who wants to go camping? <laughs> and anyway, uh, it's incredible what's out there at night. Anyhow, God created darkness, but he did not create what men would do in the darkness. You see, that goes back to that free will thing. You're sticking this one on God. Uh, yeah, I created darkness, but I didn't tell you you had to do those things that are, are wrong and harmful in the dark. You can do good things in the dark, like look for spiders at night. If we remove physical and spiritual creation, then all that would, be, that would remain would be God. Well, the Bible says God is light. 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There's an emphasis there in the English and the Greek. Revelation 22, 5, there shall be no night there. This is the new Jerusalem. This is where we're going to live um, at the end of uh, the, the uh, tribulation. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And we know that, the, that uh, the, it goes on to say the Lord is the light. He is the, 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 he and the Lamb. He then says here in verse 7, I make peace and create calamity. Well, peace is often made by war. In a fallen world, that sometimes is a good thing. Uh, we're grateful that cops, when you need one to put down the bad guy, I mean, you don't want them to show up with origami stuff. You would like him to be armed. And so that's a, you know, so just getting things in perspective here. Man cannot account for evil. You can't use a microscope. You cannot use a telescope. You can see its work, but you can't say, where does that come from? Where do viruses come from? You can only ex answer that, but so far. The poet, the physicist, they can't tell us the origins of evil. They can guess at it. They can make things up, but they've got nothing to hang their hat on. Only God reveals this to us in his word. Well, Satan's not going to do it. Uh, he's not even going to get the chance. Well, he'll, he'll lie any chance he gets. But no need, God tells us. And God works with what he has to achieve his will. And that often requires uh, just a lot of calamity, a lot of things going this way and that way. He used the Assyrians, he used the Babylonians to judge his people. So, yeah, God is saying, yeah, I did that. Because if it weren't, well, he permitted it. And he did it in that case, but there are times he permits evil. If it were any other way, then evil would be sovereign. Then evil would be calling the shots. Then things would be out of control. There would be no purpose to life. Then in the end, you get nothing but maybe more pain and suffering. And so uh, it, it, it does make sense from the things that we know. And God will use evil for his purposes, and that will not make him guilty. Job, suffering as he did, in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Job did not say, fine, this is a mess, lost all my stuff, I'm going to go get drunk or something else. He did not sin, and he did not turn on God. And so God is said to cause whatever he allows. Otherwise, there's no such thing as sovereignty. Just because it is said that way doesn't mean that's all of the story. We see God is sovereign and therefore responsible, which causes me a problem when I'm suffering. Where is the love he's talking about? Well, our imperfect knowledge will always mess things up, and that's why we default by faith to what the light that we have from his word. He cannot be God if created things can hold him accountable. It doesn't make any sense. He holds himself accountable. And he comes out and says, well, let's get, he's going to say, we're going to get to it elsewhere in Amos too. But he comes out and says, I make peace, I create calamity. How do you create calamity? Well, the conditions are under his control. And so ultimately the buck does stop there. But not in the sense of, it's sort of like 
God, manu God made a stone, but he didn't put it into the heart or the hand of Cain to strike his brother Abel and kill him with it. And so there you have. Yeah, I, I made the stone. I saw that was going to happen. I let it happen. And I got my reasons why. Uh, um, so maybe we'll open a little bit more light on this. This is a question. It's, I don't want to pretend that I've got all the easy answers on this, but I believe I have enough of them for me to sleep well at night on this one. In scripture language, as I mentioned, God is frequently said to do that which he has permitted. In physical creation, darkness is the absence of light. But the presence of God is light even in the darkness. God is light. Evil is the absence of love. But God is love. In the presence of whatever men do in darkness, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. So God's unwillingness to instantly deal with evil does not mean that what he is doing is evil. I mean, that's how we think. You, we apply that to humans. It's negligence. If, if you don't, at least where I used to live, if you didn't shovel your walk in a proper time due to negligence and someone walked and slipped on the ice, the snow, um, they could sue you for negligence. You had a responsibility as a homeowner. And now you can probably sue the shovel maker, the city, and the clouds. But uh, anyway, uh, so and it's, if it were again any other way, there would be no sovereignty. You cannot explain the wickedness of this world as merely human. And you can't explain it by saying, well, God is the cause of it. Those things don't fit. It is human, the evil that we see when humans commit evil, because there are other calamities. <laughs> it's a, you know, a volcano wiping out a village is pretty evil. Uh, anyway, uh, it is human plus something else. And we know that something else is. This is why non-Christian religions are so successful, because there's something else involved. There are supernatural forces beneath the surface, hard at work. You can create an environment where if you accept the truth and can reason your truth through against those things that are forbidden, you be killed. Again, you can go to Riyadh or Saudi Arabia and stand in Chop Chop Square and, and make the boast of Christ being the only savior, the only uh, God and you will be killed. And so they have created a situation in which truth is suppressed, and evil has done this. There are no competing deities, Isaiah is saying. God alone, Yahweh alone. There are competing ideas of God. So Isaiah, he attacks polytheism, that there are other gods, and he also attacks what is Zoroastrian beliefs where yin yang comes from there are these evil forces in the universe and they're just duking it out there's no evidence and so i just you know that's their opinion and so amos chapter 3 verse 6 there the prophet speaking with just as much authority as isaiah says if the trumpet is blown in a city will not the people be afraid that's the alarm if there is calamity in a city Will not Yahweh have done it? Well, whether he is, these rhetorical questions, whether they're rhetorical or, or uh, uh, just fair question, it's a fair question. Uh, he is saying God is never out of control, but that doesn't make him evil. So he says here in verse 7, I, the Lord, do these things. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. That puts man in his place. Don't forget. You don't know everything. You do not have perfect knowledge. You don't understand how all these things affect other things. My sister had a car, a Triumph. It was a disaster. It had two cylinders that had to be, it had like 14 of them. They all had to be in unison. Nobody on earth could get that right. It was never right. Uh, it was just, it is, it, that's why you don't find them anymore, I guess. But the, what my point is, there are other things that are involved, and to get them in, in 
to synchronize them, to get the results that God res get, is looking for under these circumstances way past us. Verse 8, I hope that doesn't confuse you any. It should not depress you. Sovereignty of God is not something we fear. We rejoice. Yeah, Lord is in control. We get it. Proving ground. This is what this life is. Thank God for the blessings that we do have and that this life is not forever. Verse 8, rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, Yahweh, have created it. And so um, his will overrules in the affairs of men. He's in control. Verse 9, woe to him who strives with his maker. That's you don't need a comment. There, let the pot sherds strive with the pot sherds of the earth. Um, shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall the handiwork say, he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? <laughs> or to the woman, what have you brought forth? <laughs> So Isaiah is saying, you know, let's reason through this. This is all we can do. We, we, have, to, we have this ability to reason. Well, let's not waste it. Cyrus wasted it. The, the crowning moment of his life before God was to send the Jews back, and he missed it. He missed the significance. Uh, he, he, you know, so anyway, now the Lord is addressing the Jews that are criticizing him for using a pagan king. That was so bitter to them. How could you use him? You know, why couldn't you not raise up an Elijah to set your people free, a Samson to come wipe out the enemy? That's how they were thinking. And Isaiah is anticipating them cha uh, challenging the, the, the earlier s section of this prophecy. Um, it is a great and deep truth to learn that we are nothing before God, and we have nothing before God. We can rate ourselves by us throughout, you know, with each other, and you can boast there. Romans, Paul talks about this, but that's not the standard that we're going to be judged by. You're not going to be able to drive by, you know, the house of numbers, jails, prisons, and say, well, I'm not as bad as those people there, so God's going to let me into heaven. Well, that's not the standard. The standard is Jesus Christ. Are you as good as him? And if you're not, you're doomed unless, unless he is your savior. And so the standards, uh, who makes the rules? Well, the God who made the planet, the potter decides what that clay is going to be, whether it's going to be a, a lamp or a jug. He's the one that decides, not the clay. And thus the folly and uselessness of rebellion. And he calls for faith. Through every turn in life, God calls for us to trust him. Until I accept, Alan Redpath wrote, uh, until I accept this, I battle with God and imply that I know better than he. Well, you don't. We don't. Again, Job chapter 9. nine. God is wise in heart, mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? Show me somebody that has turned on God and has discovered immortality. Job wrote, see, the earlier part of Job it was just the beginning of his troubles. So you see, yeah, he hung tough. You know, he didn't curse, curse God. You know, and blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord gives, Lord takes away. But now, by chapter 9, he's sick. He has lost his children. He's lost his wealth. He's lost his wife's support. He's lost his friends. He's got nothing. And though he's on that roller coaster, talking about what God did to him, <laughs> because he understands. He even says, if it's not God, then who? It can only be God. Uh, when he says what we have in chapter 9, who has hardened himself against God and prospered, it is profound coming from somebody going through such misery as he is. So the potter, it is one of the most perfect illustrations of God's sovereignty, his creativity, and his participation in creation. That, the, that image of the potter. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is, for example, the, uh, the, um, an, an emblem of, the, of his presence 
an emblem of the presence of the Holy Spirit is water. If the potter doesn't have water, he can't make anything with that clay. Uh, it becomes, if clay doesn't have water, it turns brittle and it just falls apart. So, the, the, you know, the, it's such profound lessons and just a little thing. So Isaiah 29, Isaiah 64, this chapter here, Jeremiah 18, Romans chapter 9, the potter is brought up, metaphorically pointing to God. So the ridiculous idea of clay arguing with the potter or an unborn child arguing with their parents is crazy. And God says to the Jews, the idea of you arguing with God, him using Cyrus, is just a revelation of how little faith you have. The righteous will accept it because God, that God has revealed that he is good. In a cursed world, he is still good. Verse 11, thus says Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. This is ironic language, the definition of irony. I read this. The expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically for humorous or emphatic effect. So if... When things are going wrong and you say, oh, wonderful, well, that's irony because it's not wonderful. <laughs> but you're, you know, you're just you know, kind of just expressing <laughs> that it's not wonderful and you wish it were. Well, we say, why do you bring that up? Because this verse is, is an ironic verse. And um, actually, this is, this is closer to it. There's one translation that actually gets this closer to the Hebrew if you big do the work, and I am not endorsing this translation. They just got this one right. So don't go run out and get this translation, the NIV. I shouldn't even say it, right? But it is what it's, how it translates to this verse. Concerning things to come, do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? So it's a, it's a whole different approach. And um, it's, it's probably closer to what is being said. It's still in the other ones. Most of them are just like, uh, as I read it in the New King James, but it, it, you, you have to really drill down to what is he saying. And so really it's God saying, uh, do you dare question me? The Jews of his day would have got it. The potter has the rights. Verse 12, I made, let's see how far we get tonight. I made the earth and created man on it. Uh, my hands stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded. Verse 13, I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free, not for price nor reward, says Yahweh of hosts. So God says that, um, you know, of course, he's doing this, and Cyrus is a good fit. He's raised him up in righteousness. He's not a monster. He's not like Herod, you know, ordering the deaths of the, the infants in Bethlehem. Uh, he's found in Cyrus, a Gentile unbeliever, what he needs uh, to, to bring about. This was just is so remarkable that, that God can even do these things, uh, that he can stay ahead of them, see them coming in just so many. He can get that engine to work the right way, all those cylinders firing the right way. So again, uh, pro Isaiah anticipating the backlash. Uh, the repatriated Jews, when the time comes and Cyrus sends them back, they're going to love this stuff. They're going to be, this is what Isaiah was saying. We are that generation. And we're saying as we read Revelation and we see all these things happening with these creatures and these wars. And we're looking at military ordnance and drones and cashless society and implants of chips. And we're saying we're living in the days that these prophecies were, were addressing. John wasn't aware. Or he, he couldn't do it in John's day. We are seeing it. Well, Ezra chapter 1, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Remember, there's a Jewish person writing this. The king makes a decree, says, okay, make it law. And they sort of like speech writers. And he looks at it and says, yeah, that's good, fine. But he's not converting because they use this language. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, Yahweh, God of heaven, has given me. Well, that's true. He has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, 
which is in Judah. And that is true. And the, the Jews wrote this down, showed him the prophecies. He says, I sign off on that, and there we have it. Well, there's some more to come in a little bit if we have time. So um, I've already covered that he was polytheistic. He believed in other gods. Verse 14, thus says Yahweh, the labor of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and of the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over to you. They shall be yours. And they shall walk behind you. They shall come over in chains. And they shall bow down to you. And they will make supplication to you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other. There is no other God. So now you have these characters from Africa, south of Egypt, Nubia, um, and, and they're actually quoting Isaiah, saying that there are no other gods. And uh, it, what, what this is is a picture of prisoners of war, but there's no war. So it has to do with their conscience surrendering. And the, the, Isaiah's not the only one to bring this out. Incidentally, the men of Seba, they were the ones that, that murdered Job's servants and stole all his stuff. Uh, they were one of them. Uh, anyway, um, so the men of stature, the men of, of the tall men of, of Seba, uh, the, that's, Seba is where they were from. Uh, exactly not sure. we in Africa somewhere, somewhere over in that Middle East, right? <laughs> like, like it's going to matter to us. Like, boy, I really wish I knew where that was. Uh, why? <laughs> uh, well, anyway, <clears throat> they shall come over to you. If these people can turn to the God of Abraham, so can all people. That's one of the lessons that comes out of this. When it says, and they shall be yours, they shall walk behind you, they shall come over in chains. The chains are metaphoric for convicted converts, because there's no evidence of war here. Not, not, a, not this is, we can't find this in history, and it's not likely going to happen in the future. And I'll have to back that up with Zechariah in a little bit. So, uh, moving down, they shall bow down to you. That humbled converts, finding salvation in the company of a nation that they once despised. Well, this is messianic. This is the messianic kingdom age. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talked about something like this in his day. And thus, the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. And this is Paul saying, stop speaking in tongues in front of everybody. Let know what's happening. Preach the word so they can get saved and come and understand. Revelation 3.9 Indeed, this is, taught, this is the church of Philadelphia, the, the best of the churches, uh, they and Sardis. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. And so there's going to be a humbling process, but it doesn't necessarily dictate if they are saved. Thus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Well, a lot of those people... They're going to be forced. They won't have a choice, but that doesn't mean they're going to be right with God. Better to do it by uh, free will than have an angel <laughs> shove you to the ground and say, bow. <laughs> Although I don't think it's going to happen that way, but it makes good, good, it's entertaining. They will make supplication to you saying, surely God is in you and there is no other. There is no other God. Well, this was indicated in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. The magnetism that the Jews were supposed to possess, drawing other people to Yahweh, and, and they, they never did it. Uh, when they became Christians, they did. Uh, Paul is in one, just one, John, Peter, they're examples of this. These are post-Great Tribulation converts to God, converted uh, to, to, to Christ. Zechariah chapter 8 he says it in a few places, but this is the, probably a good one. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, 
Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So at the end of the Great Tribulation, there are going to be a lot of survivors on the planet in spite of the carnage, and they won't know anything about God. Well, not much, and they want to learn. And it's not going to be just because Christ has established his kingdom in Jerusalem that they're just going to, like, osmosis is going to, you know, it's going to seep into them. No, they're going to have to learn, read the Bible, do their devotions, go to church. They're going to have to do what we do. Uh, we won't, we'll be in our glorified bodies. That'd be a whole nother, it's going to be like the angels, if the angels could live amongst us. Well, that's what it's going to be like in, after, in, the, in the kingdom age. We will be like the angels physically um, and amongst those who are still prone to death, prone to sin. going to be quite remarkable. Um, anyway, verse 15, truly you are God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Isaiah has this outburst here. Um, we remember Proverbs 25, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And then 29, 29, Deuteronomy, that God has made some things available for us, other things they're not, they're for him. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. In the English it's an acronym, ask, A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. So it's a good, easy verse to, to memorize. Um, uh, moving forward, trying to finish this so it's not fragmented. Verse 16, they shall be ashamed and also disgrace all of them. They shall go in confusion together who are makers of idols. We would like to have him put makers of idols. This is what's going to happen to you. But typical in the scripture, they make the statement, then they tell you who they're talking about. And sometimes that can be buried in the verses. Well, here, it's fortunate it's in the same verse. He's talking to the idol makers. Verse 17, but Israel shall be saved by Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor disgraced forever and ever. That's a big point. Everlasting salvation. To the church at Smyrna that was being persecuted to death, Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to all the believers. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. The second death is a person that dies, leaves this world, not saved, and then will stand before the judgment of God and be finally cast away. That's the second death. And he's saying the believers won't have the, once, you, once we leave this life, we're done with temptation and judgment. That's behind us, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There is nothing that's going to get to us then. Verse 18, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, not a question, it's a statement, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. You get the feeling God is a little annoyed with those who are saying, well, you know, God's just, you know, deism. Deism teaches God sort of wound up the earth like a clock and then walked away. And many of the founding fathers were deist. Uh, but that is an insult to God. That would make him a deadbeat dad. And he is not, no such thing. Um, he is not random. He has a purpose. And uh, he, he, God formed the earth not to be inhabited by countless God-haters and crucifiers, but it is. Uh, Colossians 1.16, I'm not going to read it, but it does say that through Christ all things were created through him and for him. There's purpose there. Verse 19 I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, Yahweh, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So he's a little, you know, again, he sounds righteously annoyed. Paul said he, he had be burned with righteous indignation towards things. Ezekiel, God said, concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, you shall know that I have done nothing without a cause, that I have done it says the Lord. So there he says, yeah, you, you, you want to blame somebody. It's my judgment. I declare things that are right. 
Well, I'm kind of pushing it here because I want to get to Charles Spurgeon's conversion at 15 years old, which maybe next week there'll be more 15-year-olds here. Uh, uh, we'll probably stop soon and just have to bake this into chapter 46. Uh, where am I? Chapter, I'm on verse 19. I declare things that are right. Well, yes, Lord, because I am... I tire of this generation's values and views of God and life. This culture without God's guidance, it becomes quite sickening. But that does not excuse, does not excuse us from doing what we're supposed to do. Well, I've had my 60 minutes. We will start at verse 20 and go right into the next chapter because we still have to talk about the Spurgeon conversion. Let's pray. It, you know, if, if we could just get here an hour earlier, <laughs> that would be like, <laughs> and I wouldn't be ready. So anyway, it doesn't work. Let's pray. Our Father, so much in the word of your word that is just so attractive. And then there's that ugly side of life where we have to go and make it happen. And sometimes it's very beautiful and sometimes it's just very demanding. But all the time, it is because of your love towards us that we're able to pull it off. And um, things are better with you by far. I thank you for my salvation. It is the most special thing, most precious thing I have. And it is uh, certainly the desire of the believer to have everybody be saved, realize this is the most perfect possession that we could know, to have a friendship with you. May it get us all home safely tonight. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen.